This chapter of my travels takes me to Northern Africa, specifically in this case the French Arabic country of Tunisia, where we'll be hopping on board their flag carrier Tunisia on the only transatlantic service from this country all the way to Montreal, Canada. Now, Tunisia only has a couple A330s, and they use them mostly for their flights to Paris. However, a few times a week, they do have this flight operating all the way to the North American city. Join me on board in business class today as we begin our journey, and as always, go ahead and use those timestamps below to find the content that you're looking for. Now, the airport here in Tunis actually isn't all that big, considering there's never really that many flights out of Tunis on any given day. That being said, the inside of the terminal is a wonderfully ornate style of building that carries throughout the entire terminal. Initially here in the door to the right is where we find the main check-in desks. You're going to find ticket offices for all the airlines and just past that you're going to find check-in desks for each airline. The signs will point you into the right direction based on the counters that you want to go to. However, keep in mind that the counters only open 3 hours before your scheduled departure. For example, today for our flight to Montreal, the Tunisia air counters were open. However, for our specific flight, they weren't accepting bags yet. So I got in the lines here with the rest of the people waiting to check in for our flight to Montreal. I figured that somewhere there had to be check-in for business class passengers, and just on the other side of the counters I did find that business class desk for Tunisia Air passengers, however just like the normal check-in desks, it didn't accept passengers until 3 hours before their scheduled departure time, so I had about 10-15 to 15 minutes to kill before they accepted my bags. With my bags checked, there was plenty of signs pointing us off to the departure area. Once getting over there, we were back in the main ornate part of the terminal where we saw one of the more decorated ceilings that I've ever seen in an airport. It gave me similar vibes to that of Paro Bhutan's airport. If you've seen my last video, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. And directly across from that, you'll see the main entrance for departing passengers to head through the initial passport immigration stand and then off through the normal security and into the terminal. As far as the airport goes here in Tunis, you can see it's one big building here. To the top of the screen is where the domestic gates are, and to the bottom of the screen you can see where the hallway extends out to the rest of the international gates. We however just popped out past security right about here on the map. First stop of course is the obligatory duty free store that you must pass through to get into the main stretch of the terminal, and from there we head off to the rest of the international gates. You can see here that the airport averages about three departures per hour, so the terminal is never all that busy, so a couple restaurants and shops is plenty for this airport at any given time. At the end of the main building we reach this area here, where with a short left turn we can head down this hallway that takes us to the rest of the international gates here in Tunis, Carthage Airport. In the central area, you'll find one little cafe under the main domed roof, and around that is where you're going to find all the rest of the gates under their individual areas. Around that, you're going to find the rest of the restrooms, and of course, a bunch of outdoor smoking areas like you can see here at the entrance to each gate. Our gate today is gate number 57, so as we head through the doorway for 57, you can see that our gate area is still completely empty. Our plane is here, however, they have not yet started the preparations for this flight. Entering the gate area here, if we take a look at the map, you'll see that every gate area is its own individual domed roof, just like the central domed roof. So you can see this main roof over every gate area, covering all the seats for that departure. Out of this window, we did get the first view of our A330-200 of Tunis Air that had actually arrived previously from Paris Charles de Gaulle and had been sitting here since the night before. In the meantime, I headed back to the main building, specifically over to this corner right here. Why, you might ask? Well, it's because if you head back to the main building in that corner and take a left, you'll notice the lounge for business class passengers on Tunisia. Right next to this mural here, you'll see the entrance to the main lounge, which is pronounced in some French way that I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce it in. The lounge isn't all that grand, however, it was a nice place to start our journey. Once you get inside the lounge, you're going to see the familiar French Arabic style of design that's very traditional here in Northern Africa. You'll see plenty of seats, all grouped into separate areas all around the lounge. 
You'll also find a bar in this lounge, and around the corner from that is where you're going to find the main buffet. The buffet is separated into a few parts, starting off with the yogurts and the desserts, as well as a water station. Past that is where you'll find the cold cuts and the salads, as well as wonderful olives. Around the corner you'll find the breads and the assortment of pastries that can go with any coffees or teas that they can also offer you at the bar area. Immediately adjacent to that is a number of tables and chairs which I believe to be the main dining area designed for those wishing to eat while they're here. You'll also find a large number of chairs all fairly comfortable and all with their own tables scattered throughout the lounge, although interestingly enough I noticed a lack of charging outlets in this lounge. So if you are looking to charge your device, be prepared to get here early enough where there's not a lot of people in the lounge, and you can stake out one of these spots like I have next to the relaxing room, where you have a countertop view of the ramp and also some charging ports. You can see from my buffet I decided to go with more of a salad option with some juice as I looked out at not only the view of the ramp, but my own A330 that was about to take me shortly to Montreal. Sitting in this spot proved to be advantageous to my timing as I watched the crew here getting out from their bus underneath the terminal and getting to the airplane. More importantly, I saw when the first officer went to start his walk around, which meant that it was my cue to leave the lounge and head out to my gate. Now that we were closer to boarding, they were checking everyone's boarding pass and passport to get into the gate area. Some people were pulled for additional screening. I, however, was able to get through without any issues and into the main gate area. Before long, a gentleman came out and said in French something about the plane being ready to board, I presume. However, I could not understand it, but I did understand everyone lining up as fast as they could. He did shortly after say that passengers traveling in business class could line up with those with disabilities or needing extra time getting down the jet bridge on the other side, which meant that we were able to get on the airplane shortly before the rest of the passengers, giving it a little more order than a lot of the other airports that you'll find in Africa. It wasn't long before we made it on board our airplane and I was showed to the business class cabin which is set up in a 222 configuration here on Tunisia Air's A330s. Now this A330 is only about 8 years old and has lived its entire life with Tunisia Air, however these cabins are about as ancient as they come. The seats here, although comfy, you can see have a strange design and color scheme that you don't see on pretty much any other airline and they don't really offer the same type of amenities and privacy that you might find on other airlines. Looking at the seat, however, you've got the reading light over your left shoulder, which can be turned on and dimmed. Your armrest to the left side, folded up or down, depending on whether or not you needed access to the area underneath. That area, by the way, included things such as the universal charging port for all sorts of devices and chargers. It also included your USB port, your headset port, as well as a port that's about as old as you'll ever find. The cup holder here in the main center console was an interesting design, however it did work to hold my drinks although it was a little bit slippery. The tray table also came out of there, didn't come out as a bifold like most tray tables, all as one piece. It was actually a pretty nice size, however not the most sturdy or level surface you'll find. In front of you is your seatback TV, which all TVs were still off at this stage, and also had this strange little spot on top which I never figured out what that was for. You'll also find between the TVs the literature pocket which houses the Tunisia Air safety cards and above that is the in-flight shopping magazines and Tunisia Air signature magazine. Below that was the cup holders which seemed to be home to a drink that was dirtier or messier than any drink that I was going to have on this flight and to the right of that is where you find a pocket for literature of your own that you'd like to store at the seat. The footwell here you see had plenty of room for me, I actually couldn't even reach the end with my feet. However, there's not exactly under seat storage, although they didn't seem to have a problem with the location of my backpack. I am a big, big fan of being able to adjust each part of the seat individually, and this seat offered just that. In addition to the preset modes, you can move the seat back, the lumbar, and the leg rest all individually to get the seat exactly where you wanted it. In the right armrest was where we found the seatback TV remote, which, once the TV did start working, it was a nice way to control it. On the seat next to me, you see this button, which presumably extends or retracts the leg rest. It took me a while to find it on my seat, and it turns out that's because my button was stuck in and wouldn't actually do anything. By far the most disappointing part of this journey, however, was the condition of the seat. It just seemed to be super worn out and dirty. From the headrest to, of course, the footrest, as well as anything from the armrest to the divider or anything else that was commonly touched by passengers, the seat just needed a major revamp. 
I did, however, get to look through the seatback literature, which I was pleasantly surprised by some of the content in that. Unfortunately, I don't read Arabic or French, so there wasn't a whole lot of stuff for me to consume. I did learn some information about the country of Tunisia, of which I saw very little on this trip, and they also had an area for children with some games, including this Harry Potter maze that was definitely mistranslated from French to English. Past that was just some information on the airline itself, including pictures that just seemed to be weirdly blurry, including the pictures of the lounge and the country itself. It did, however, offer a fun insight into the fleet that they have here at Tunisia, as well as a map of all the destinations that they serve. Now unfortunately, this cabin got extremely hot and there was no overhead air vents. Multiple passengers in the cabin were fanning themselves with safety cards, so much so that the crew actually elected to open the front door for extra ventilation until they were ready to leave. Unfortunately, it had rained the night before in Tunisia, so I was really struggling to get some content out of these rain-covered windows, but every once in a while, I could get the focus I needed. And here's about 7 sad seconds of the Tunisia A330 lavatory, which has no flowers or personal touch, just a normal white box. With the door shut, before we started our pushback, the signature safety video of Tunisia began playing, which I was pleasantly surprised to see as our seatback TVs were finally turned on. It was also all controlled by this computer here, which may have well been from the 80s or 90s just based on how old it looked. As we taxied out, we were treated to this video about the construction of the Tunisia A330. More specifically, how it was this great new addition to their fleet. And while 8 years old isn't exactly the oldest airplane in the world, the interior may have you believing otherwise.
Once we got in the air, I decided to try and connect it to new shares in-flight Wi-Fi, which did not exist, does not exist, and doesn't seem like it will exist anytime soon. An unfortunate touch to an airplane that's only about eight years old. The bulkhead TVs were switched to the rotating map, so I was able to track our progress. However, I also learned through this that not every TV was working. And now taking a walk through the preset modes of the seat, as you see first the fully sitting position which was used for taxi, takeoff, and landing. After that we get to the recline preset, which is between the fully sitting and fully laying mode. This one was nice for the remainder of the flight in which I just wanted to relax and watch some TV. Speaking of the lie flat mode, you will see that the lie flat doesn't really lie flat at all. You'll see here not only is the seat and it's still at an angle, but it also still has a number of bends in it, making it not exactly the most flat bed when it comes to sleeping. In addition, they didn't offer any pillows or blankets to passengers that were wishing to sleep on this flight. After that, I decided to cruise the in-flight entertainment. However, I found that my screen and the other screens had not yet been turned on by the crew. I decided to try and use my CPAC TV remote to try and turn them on, but still had no luck in doing so. Luckily, I had my laptop, so I was able to watch downloaded content on that. I was able to keep it charged on my universal charging port at my seat. Unfortunately, that charging port didn't exactly charge my laptop, but it didn't let it die either. Shortly after, the flight attendants came by to pass out the amenity kits, which were nice because up to this point there hadn't really been any extra amenities passed out to the passengers. The amenity kit was fairly basic, however at this point I was just grateful to receive anything, and having a dental kit and some nice lotions was a nice touch. As a matter of fact, the moisturizing cream and hand cream were a great touch to have on this flight. They then came by and passed out these Seatback TV headphones, which weren't of the greatest quality, however the silver lining was that they told us that they would soon be booting up the in-flight entertainment system that I had been long awaiting for. Sure enough, shortly after, it started up and I set it up, got to the main menu, and browsed the options that Tanishare has to offer. Starting off first with the video option where they have an assortment of TV shows and movies. The sheer amount of movies they had was actually pretty nice to see. They had a good selection, however, I will say the selection they had was somewhat strange across categories. Most of them were just not things that you would expect to find on airplanes or just that you haven't seen on other airplanes. However, it was nice to switch it up and there was plenty for me to keep myself entertained on my flight to Canada. The TV shows were more of the same story. Most of them, unfortunately, were in either French or Arabic. They did have some English TV shows, and the ones that they did have weren't the normal ones. It didn't actually pass the Big Bang test. However, the other thing was that they only had a couple random episodes from random seasons, so I instead kept myself entertained with Fresh Prince. The audio that they did have was actually somewhat interesting, considering that they had Arabic music and Western music, and the music that they did have was from all different eras of time. As someone who's more familiar with the recent music, I was able to find things like Harry Styles, Beyonce, and Lil Nas X. They actually had full albums, so within that there was a number of songs that actually would continue playing while you search for something to watch after that. They also had a series of games. Once again, I was actually pleasantly surprised with the games that they did have on here. They weren't exactly the games that you have on most airlines, but they were actually all pretty fun and I played most of them, something that I usually don't do when I'm on these flights. Battleship especially was a nice throwback to childhood. They did have this application section which had a number of items, unfortunately most of them weren't working on today's flight. However what I did spend some time in was the Tunisia section, which had a number of items telling the story of Tunisia and the country itself, such as things like their network map, unfortunately not including the route that we were on today. Also had some information on the different aircraft that they had in their fleet. That was followed up by a nice string of pictures from Tunisia history. The Discover Tunisia section was possibly my favorite part, however. It negated the need for any sort of seatback magazine, starting off with things like the history of the country, talking about where it came from and what it is today, facts and figures about the country, including a map of all their airports. However, one of the most informative things that I wish I would have had on my flight to Tunisia is a scroll through of all of the sites that you would need to see while you're visiting this wonderful country. Lastly was a section about the activities to do and take part in while you're here in the country of Tunisia. After that, the last feature on the TV was the in-flight map which displayed the information in French and Arabic, but not English. 
After that, it was finally time to get ready for our first meal service. I opted to start my meal with a nice cup of Coca-Cola, while in the meantime I watched a movie that I had never seen before. There was no menu nor choice of starter, instead we were all handed the same tray. The tray included a seafood starter option and I will say it was one of the better starters I've had on an airplane. It included things like prawns, some sauces that I couldn't identify but were pretty good, and what seemed like a calamari option, which was fantastic. I also appreciated the Tunisia Air branded silverware that came with every serving. Between the starter and the entree, we had reached the northern part of the Mediterranean Sea on the southern part of Europe as we crossed over France and the rest of the mountains. We were then handed out the starter, which was so good that I completely forgot to get a video before I started eating. Now I decided to go with the chicken option, the sauce on it was absolutely fantastic and it was one of the better cooked chickens that I've had on airplanes. Sorry I wasn't able to get more, but this does speak volumes to just how good the food was on board this airplane. Then came the dessert, which was a cup of coffee alongside a date tart and a cup of fresh fruit of honeydew melon and kiwi. It was not long, however, until we finished our meal, we reached the northern part of Europe and said goodbye to the coastline, which we wouldn't see again until we reached the east coast of Canada. At this point, most of the cabin decided to get a little bit of rest. Not exactly sleep, considering that unfortunately this cabin wasn't exactly the most conducive for sleep. However, they were able to get a little bit of relaxation before we got to Montreal. The crew, however, did have one little surprise in store for us, as once the crew swapped out for takeoff and landing to the crew's crew, we decided to celebrate the captain's birthday, of which his family actually joined us on board in the majority of the seats here in the business class cabin. They joined us in singing happy birthday to him and passing out his cake. Yeah, happy birthday, happy birthday, happy birthday to you. That was the last we heard from the crew until we were a couple hours before landing and they came through to pass out our second and final meal of the flight, which included a cheesy pasta lasagna-y type of entree which was a little too rich for me personally. However, the sides were great, especially the smoked salmon. I also liked that they came through offering tea to those passengers who wanted it, and the desserts of fresh fruit once again, and especially the cake was cooked to perfection. Now we had finally reached mainland Canada about an hour and a half from landing. However, looking out the window, you'd be none the wiser. With the lights on and the windows rolled up, it was time to begin our arrival into Montreal.
with all of that, I welcome you to Montreal, Canada. Now I mentioned in cruise I couldn't figure out if we were just celebrating the captain's birthday or if he was retiring after this flight. The water cannon salute here was a great way to signify that I might not speak French, but a water cannon salute does seem like a great way to celebrate a captain's final flight before retirement. So if that is the case, I wish him the best of luck in wherever his journeys may take him post-retirement. As we bid adieu to our Tanisha Air A330, it's time for our final thoughts on Tanisha Air, their business class, and the Tunis Airport, as well as the full Tanisha Air business class experience. Now, I will say that obviously the airplane needs a little bit of upgrades, however, the soft product that they do offer on board their flights shows a lot of promise. I do think that the food that they offer was wonderful, the cabin crew was incredibly nice and attentive the entire flight, especially tending to me with the English speaking flight attendants after realizing that I couldn't speak French or Arabic, which was a great personal touch. I think the top question is would I fly it again? And I think really the answer here is that if they went through with some cabin renovations, I would absolutely find myself back on Tanisha Air. I think comparatively with the other products that you'll find throughout Africa, their soft product is right there. All they need is a brand new cabin renovation and they can be right up there with the rest of them. Air Algerie went through a similar renovation and they're currently redoing their A330s in addition to buying a new fleet of aircraft. If Tanisha Air follows this suit, my guess is they wouldn't be far behind. For now though, I welcome you all to Montreal, Canada. I thank you all for joining me on this adventure and I hope you join me next week where we try out the other North African route to Montreal on Air Algerie from Algiers to Montreal. But until now and then, I'll see you guys next time. Safe travels.